This is a case that truly highlights the perils that people in the public eye face every single day. Far too often when prominent figures are subjected to unwanted attention, people excuse it as being part of the job. Some people say that because well-known people put themselves out there, it's just part of the job, something they risk as they ascend into prominence. Over the years, countless celebrities have been stalked. Some have been attacked and some have even been killed. Many of these terrifying cases have led to changes in the law and the development of specialised units in police forces. Despite these sweeping changes, prominent figures are still being targeted all across the globe. During the pandemic in 2020, a television presenter found herself the focus of someone who wanted to do her and her family harm. Louise Minchin is a familiar face on British television. So in 2012, she hosted the BBC One programme, Breakfast Three Days a Week, alongside her co-host, Dan Walker. Before this, Louise had co-hosted the BBC One show, Real Rescues, and she had been a guest host on the one show, which really is a staple in British television. I'm sure after this episode, if you Google her, you'll recognise her face. Well, as is common for celebrities on social media, Louise found herself the victim of online trolls. People who said negative things about how she looked, how she spoke, how she acted. Well, Louise really struggled with the comments. She could read a thousand lovely comments and one negative one. But it was always that one negative one that stuck out in her mind. So in December of 2019, Louise decided to take a step back from social media. She didn't delete her accounts, but she stopped checking them so frequently. While presenting BBC Breakfast around the same time, she made reference to her decision to take a break from social media. She said that people may consider her oversensitive, and she conceded that maybe she did need a thicker skin. But she said that whenever she read a horrible comment about herself, she really struggled to shrug it off. I'm sure everybody with a social media platform can relate. It really is such a bummer when you log in and see something nasty about yourself. And mean comments, they really can cut deep sometimes. So Louise's teenage daughter, Mia, offered to take over her social media accounts. This meant that Louise could still have an online presence, which is obviously super important for people in the public eye, but she didn't have to deal with any of the trolls or hard comments. In July of 2020, Louise and her family went on a well-deserved staycation. On the evening of the 14th of July, however, their tranquility was shattered when Mia came into Louise's bedroom and said that somebody had sent through some horrible messages on Instagram. Louise was expecting it to just be your average troll, and at first that's what it appeared to be. Somebody just sending a handful of weird messages. Louise first of all thought nothing of it, but a couple of hours later, Mia came back into Louise's bedroom and said that the person who sent the messages was now following her on Instagram. Louise had always taken her children's privacy seriously. She never tagged them on any posts on social media. So how exactly did this person find her daughter Mia's personal Instagram? Louise also took her own privacy seriously, and she never said anything overly identifying in interviews or while she was on air. I mean, she certainly never gave any indication of where exactly she lived. However, things quickly went from strange to scary as it became apparent that the person sending the messages knew exactly where Louise lived with her family. On a photograph of Louise she posted online, the anonymous person commented, you can see your garden from there. In another message, they shared Louise's home address, along with the description of the two cars that were currently parked in the driveway. Another message warned, I know where you live. While the messages were terrifying, the situation became even more unnerving when the anonymous person began making sexual threats against Mia, who at the time was only 18 years old. All of the messages to Louise and Mia had come during the COVID pandemic. Disturbingly, calls to the National Stalking Helpline rose by 11% over the course of the pandemic. 
figures that were collected by Unmasking Stalking, a survey that was carried out by the Susie Lamplew Trust, found that after the first lockdown, 82% of stalking victims were stalked on social media websites. Cyberstalking in particular reached exponential levels as everybody across the United Kingdom was cooped up at home with nothing but time on their hands. Just a couple of months earlier, in January of 2020, stalking protection orders, which are also known as SPOs, were introduced in the United Kingdom. So these allowed police to ban offenders from contacting their victims online as well as in person. However, by June, only 294 had been successfully applied. This was just 2% of all stalking arrests. There had been calls for a stalker register, which would work the same way as the sexual offenders register works. But the government rejected the idea. According to statistics, out of the 1.5 million stalking victims each year, as few as 0.1% ever see justice. This is in part due to the fact that police can oftentimes fail to see when somebody is a victim of stalking. As I've obviously mentioned before, stalking still remains very hard to define. So the messages to Louise and Mia only continued, and Mia in particular was absolutely petrified of going home from their staycation. And understandably so. What if this anonymous person had gained access to their home? What if they were waiting for them, ready to make good on those threats? After three days of unrelenting messages and comments, the Instagram randomly vanished, and with it, so did the messages. Thankfully, Louise had print screened everything, and once they returned home, she immediately called the BBC, who in turn contacted the police. It really was a terrifying prospect for Louise and Mia that somebody knew where they lived and was threatening violence. Louise later said, You don't know who they are, so you don't know that the person standing next to you isn't them. Louise not only feared for her life, but for the lives of her family. She was left a shell of herself, in a constant state of anxiety and fear. Both Louise and Mia struggled to sleep at night, afraid that whoever was harassing them would break in. Practically every aspect of their lives changed. They switched up where they went for daily walks and runs, while Mia was far too terrified to ever be home alone. Louise commented, We are constantly on the lookout for who might be watching us or following us. We still don't feel safe, and we probably never will. For Louise, the anonymity of her stalker and the fact that they remained unidentified resulted in her having to take extra security measures. To feel safer at home, Louise installed CCTV and she added extra fencing. Police advised her to call them if she ever saw somebody outside her home that looked out of place. In addition to the anxiety and fear, Louise had an overwhelming sense of guilt felt that her profile had possibly put her family in danger. She even considered leaving her job at BBC Breakfast, but she was ultimately talked out of it by Mia, who told her not to let the stalker win. The weeks transformed into months, and they dragged by achingly slow for the family. Finally, at the end of March of 2021, there was a breakthrough in the case. Police were able to trace the Instagram account to Carl Davies a 43-year-old man from Flint in North Wales. Disturbingly, Louise wasn't the first celebrity that Davies had stalked. Back in 2017, he had been convicted of stalking his ex-girlfriend, Nicola Roberts, from the band Girls Aloud. After they broke up, he threatened to stab and burn her and also set up 35 fake social media profiles so that he could harass her. He had sent over 3,000 messages from these fake profiles. Davies was convicted of this offence and he was handed a lifetime restraining order, but he was only handed a suspended prison sentence. In the aftermath of the conviction, Nicola had actually demanded that tougher action be taken against stalkers. I mean, a suspended prison sentence. It doesn't really work as a deterrent. In March of 2021, Davies appeared in court where he pleaded not guilty to two offences of stalking 
and causing serious alarm or distress. His defence attorney, Duncan Bold, claimed that he was innocent. He commented, The issue is, he didn't send the messages. Davies was released on bail under the condition he do not contact Louise or her daughter, or approach any BBC buildings. It was expected that Davies would be facing trial on the charges, but in October of the same year he appeared in court and unexpectedly pleaded guilty instead. The judge adjourned the sentencing for a psychiatric report to be prepared on Davies. He was claiming that when he committed the offences, he was suffering from post-traumatic distress disorder from his time in the army, in particular when he was serving in Afghanistan with the Parachute Regiment. According to Davies' defence attorney, when he left the forces, he had very little treatment. He further added that Davies had been self-medicating, mostly with alcohol. He further commented that Davies had pleaded guilty because he had no recollection of the offences, but he had now reached the conclusion that he must have committed the offences while he was drunk. Once again, Davies was bailed while awaiting sentencing. He was ordered not to have any contact with Louise or Mia on any social media site, and was ordered not to encourage any third parties to refer to them on social media as well. The sentencing phase came in December. In court, the results of the psychiatric evaluation were disclosed. It revealed that Davies had indeed been diagnosed with PTSD. His defence attorney had mentioned it when he was pleading guilty, but he had never actually been diagnosed until after the guilty plea. So the defence had hoped that that diagnosis would work in Davies' favour, in receiving a more lenient sentence. Louise provided a victim impact statement that was read aloud by the prosecutor. In her statement, she laid bare the terror she had felt over the course of the ordeal. She said that while a year had passed, she and her family were still extra cautious. She said that they still didn't feel safe and they most likely never would. That's the effect that stalking has, and that many people don't seem to realise. Even long after the incident, the effects still linger, and they most likely will for years to come. Ultimately, Carl Davies was sentenced to two years and eight months in prison, and he was handed an indefinite restraining order. In handing down the sentence, Judge Nicola Safman said that she had taken the post-traumatic stress diagnosis into consideration and said that upon Davies' release, he should be offered treatment options. As Davies was hauled off to jail to begin his sentence, Louise logged into her Twitter account to issue a short statement. She thanked the police service and prosecution service for their hard work in the investigation and the successful prosecution. She said that the sentence was a clear message to other people out there who may want to threaten violence on social media thinking that they can do so with impunity. In the wake of the sentence, the BBC got in contact with a journalism safety advisor at the Metropolitan Police. The BBC wanted to improve procedures when it came to the stalking of members of staff, and they wanted to offer better guidance on how they could deal with abuse, both online and in person. While they certainly had acted accordingly and provided Louise with assistance, they still wanted to improve how they handled such situations. In a statement, the BBC said, The safety and security of our journalists around the world and in the UK is paramount, and we're constantly looking for ways to ensure we have the right measures in place. It's completely unacceptable that journalists should ever be threatened or targeted for doing their jobs. Since the grim stalking ordeal, Louise and Mia had undergone counselling to try and make sense of the situation and heal. Louise commented, that while they are both doing much, much better, what they went through had left an indelible mark. Even today, they both remain extremely cautious around people in a way that they never were beforehand. That's sadly not much of a surprise. According to a recent study, 78% of stalking victims report symptoms that are consistent with PTSD. Then in January of 2020, Louise shared her story with the Daily Mail and said that she was choosing to speak up to show other victims that they are not alone and they are not powerless. Far too often, there's very little support for victims of stalking, but more and more victims are coming forward. Louise said that she hoped her story would send a clear message 
that while you may think you're anonymous online, you may not stay anonymous forever. Later that year, she recalled the traumatic experience as well as her journey to recovery in a documentary titled Louise Minchin, The Truth About Stalking. In the documentary, Louise asked a number of tough questions about whether enough is being done by police and the government to prevent stalking incidents from happening. While Louise Minchin's stalker was identified, arrested, convicted and sentenced to prison, unfortunately not all stalking cases have this outcome. In fact, very few do. Even today there are still calls across the United Kingdom for the implementation of a National Stalkers Register. The fact that such a register doesn't exist only highlights all too well that many people still can't recognise the severity and the impact that stalking has on its victims. Well that is all for today's episode of Unwanted Attention. Again, thank you so so much for watching. Please do share your thoughts on this case in the comment section below and make sure to click subscribe for more true crime stories from me.